I have to start with something in the news. Uh, the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York has charged one of Governor Kathy Hochul's aides with acting as an illegal agent for the Chinese government. If that is true, uh, what are the diplomatic consequences that might emerge? Robbie, this is, um, as you know, a law enforcement matter and a matter for the Justice Department and the U.S. attorney. So it would not be proper for me to comment. So I really have nothing to say on the matter and would refer you to the the U.S. Attorney's Office. I understand that, but clearly there will be some diplomatic uh, repercussions. There were rumors in New York that uh, China's Consul General in New York was expelled. Uh, that was then walked back, um, but we will, of course, see how that develops. I want to get to some bigger picture topics in a bit, but one other question on recent news. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was in Beijing last week, and our audience has read and studied the official readout, so I won't make you repeat them, but what I would like is to get your personal sense of how the meetings went and what that tells you about the state uh, of the U.S.-China relationship. Well, Jake Sullivan had um, a very productive trip and I think very constructive trip here to Beijing last week. He had 12 hours of meetings with uh, Director of the Foreign Affairs Commission and Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He met um, for the first time, uh, the vice chair of the Central Military Commission, General Zhang Yuxia, uh, and we have never met him before in his current position. And of course, most importantly, Jake uh, and I and others were able to meet with President Xi Jinping last week for another important meeting. This is a channel that we have had since 2021. Uh, Jake has had nine meetings now, either with Wang Yi or with his predecessor, Yang Jiaxue, and if you combine that with a very good channel that Secretary Tony Blinken has had with uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Secretary Blinken saw uh, President Xi when he was here in April, and you add to that what Secretary Janet Yellen of the Treasury Department has done, Secretary Gina Raimondo has done, we now have connectivity with the Chinese leadership. And I, that might sound ordinary to some of the people watching this podcast, but it's actually quite extraordinary and it's actually quite important. As recently as February, 2023, in the wake of the balloon incident, we were really at rock bottom in this relationship. We did not have reliable cabinet level channels. We sought to create them in 2023 and, and again in this year, and I think we've succeeded. It does not mean that we have resolved by any means um, the vast number of disagreements we have and the competition we have between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China, but it does mean that we're connected diplomatically, that we can talk through some of these problems, and we can avoid conflict uh, while defending our national interest. I think that's a very, very important goal for this relationship. If you assume the way that I do, that this is a um, structural competition, structural in military, economic, technology uh, realms, and it will remain structural, and I think intensely competitive well into the next decade. So we have to manage this relationship in such a way that we defend American national interests, but we avoid a conflict at the same time. President Biden feels very strongly about that. And I know that Jake, Jake Sullivan was very much in that, in that um, frame of mind when he was here last week. That's very encouraging to hear. And there's little doubt that the last 18 months have been so much more positive in terms of the connections you're describing. But that said, there have been some worrying flare-ups in the South China Sea and other hotspots. Can you give us a sense of how some of these connections work in moments like that? Well, to take um, the South China Sea, for instance, uh, and the U.S. treaty commitment to the Philippines, uh, we've seen a, a series of very unfortunate and very ill-advised uh, efforts by the government of China to intimidate the Philippines at 2nd Thomas Shoal, at Sabina Shoal, in an incident at Scarborough Shoal, just to name three incidents over the last month or so. And we've used our diplomatic channels. Certainly, I have done so as ambassador here. Secretary Blinken did when he was here a couple of months ago, and Jake Sullivan did last week to tell the Chinese leadership very directly, we have an ironclad uh, commitment to defend the Philippines uh, under Article 4 of our 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty. And it's very important to be able to say that and to be able to talk through this issue and to encourage directly uh, 
the Chinese leadership to try to resolve these disagreements with the Philippines peacefully and through diplomacy and not through Chinese ships ramming or water cannoning Filipino ships. And so it really is important that we have these direct conversations on an issue like that. And of course, the relationship with the Philippines is so much more clear cut. But then you have Taiwan. And given everything you've been saying uh, in this conversation, it just strikes me that when former Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, it really set U.S.-China relations back. What happens when there's a new administration and you have other high-level delegations clamoring to visit Taiwan? Well, you know, we've had a remarkable consistency here in the United States, States um, on our Taiwan policy ever since President Nixon's trip to China in 1972 and in all the subsequent administrations. We've held every administration to a one China policy. And, uh, and, and, and we've made sure that we've been consistent across all those decades in what we've said to the Chinese leadership and obviously, it's uh, in, in a way, it's been very successful because despite all of the inflammatory rhetoric and some of the inflammatory actions, uh, since Speaker Pelosi, for instance, since her visit here uh, just over two years ago, we've seen a marked increase in Chinese naval and air activity in the Taiwan Strait. Despite all that, the Taiwan Strait has remained peaceful since the early 1970s. And so we think the One China policy is working and we are resolutely committed to it. And the Chinese leadership knows that. Jake Sullivan's uh, trip here last week, Secretary Blinken's trip, all the meetings that I have, we're able to make clear to the Chinese what we think should happen um, in terms of restraint uh, and adherence to the status quo and our insistence that there be a peaceful resolution of the cross-strait differences. Hmm. I want to ask you about fentanyl and uh, the context in which that came up last week in all of the high-level meetings. Uh, this is, of course, a killer that is affecting regular Americans in all kinds of unexpected and also heartbreaking ways. And what I want to understand is why is it so hard for Beijing to completely stop the flow of precursor elements to the United States? Well, this is a major issue for us. President Biden raised it directly with President Xi at the San Francisco summit last November. We've had innumerable discussions. And the basic problem is that a, a great percentage, uh, a majority of the precursor chemicals that the drug cartels in Mexico use to fabricate the synthetic opioid fentanyl, they come from China. Now, I think it's important to say, and to be fair to the government here, they don't come from the Chinese government. They come from illicit Chinese firms. And so we have begun an effort last November, and we've made some progress with the Chinese government here to make sure that they're beginning to shut down the flow of these precursor chemicals. So just several weeks ago, uh, the government of China listed three precursor chemicals now prohibited for export from China to Central America and to Mexico or for anywhere else in the world for that matter, We've begun as a part of this effort to have, I think, much broader and more successful law enforcement cooperation on the fentanyl issue uh, from the Drug Enforcement Agency, which is doing, I think, a really fine job in connecting with the Chinese on this, with the Department of Homeland Security and specifically Secretary Ali Mayorkas, who has formed a relationship with the Minister of Public Security, Wang Xiaohong, and they've been able to work through some of these problems. So we're by no means at the end of this process, rather we're at the beginning, but I'm encouraged by some of the progress. We want to see more actions, specific actions by the government of China on the, on the precursor chemical issue. We want to see arrests, obviously, and we also want to see attention to illicit finance because part of the problem here is um, shadowy finance networks, criminal networks that fund these sales and that fund the drug cartels as well. It's a top, top flight issue for us, Ravi. As you know, fentanyl is the leading cause of death in America, of Americans 18 to 45. And so we feel an absolute responsibility and commitment to keep this at the forefront of the U.S.-China relationship. And that's something that, that I do here and that my team does here at the American Embassy. Mm, that's good to hear. So, Ambassador, I want to take a bit of a step back. You've been a diplomat since the 1980s. And when you started off, 
there was a big push to get China to open up to the world. There was a general belief that this would help American companies and also the global economy. And in the last few years, particularly since 2018, the consensus has shifted dramatically in Washington. There's a bipartisan belief now that China is more of a challenge than an opportunity, and many people see it plainly as a threat. So here's what I want to ask you, as someone who's been uh, in government, uh, in public service for both of these eras, the era that wanted more partnership with China and the one that wants to constrain it. How do you explain this immense policy shift? Well, I think that policy shift, and you're right to ask the question, it's a central question, that policy shift has been, I think, motivated by changing circumstances and changing policies here in China. I first came to China in 1988 as a young American diplomat accompanying uh, our then Secretary of State George Shultz. I came back in 1989 with President George H.W. Bush and have been here you know, consistently since. Um, in China in the late 1980s and the early 1990s was a different country. It was in a way more open to the rest of the world. It wasn't clear back then that, um, that China was gonna be so aggressive towards its neighbors in the South China Sea in the East China Sea, or even in the Taiwan Strait. Deng Xiaoping's policy in the 80s was very different on that issue. You remember, uh, hide, uh, hide your light and bide your time. But China changed. And we've seen a more aggressive China uh, in this region. We've seen a China that in economic terms, through, its, through forced technology transfer, through intellectual property theft, not at all creating a level playing field for American companies. And I see that here. It's a very different China. So administrations have had to react to that change. And we have a much more competitive framework. And I very much agree with that competitive framework. And that's a basis of our policy. We're competing in the security realm with China in the Indo-Pacific, and that's an intense competition. We're competing technologically. If you think about uh, developments in artificial intelligence and in biotechnology and quantum mathematics, we have a range of problems on the economic front. Or, right, as I talked to you today, our Undersecretary of Commerce, Marisa Lago, is here, and she and I were addressing some of these issues with the Chinese just yesterday. And of course, we have longstanding uh, abiding commitments to defend human rights here uh, and to be critical we have to be of what the Chinese are doing in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, the lack of religious freedom. So this is a very challenging relationship and I feel that as we practice diplomacy uh, with our Chinese counterparts here in Beijing and around this country. And I think that is in many ways the centerpiece of this relationship. The challenge is can we compete and yet avoid the kind of conflict that would be catastrophic for the world? That's a major responsibility that we feel in the Biden administration. And as we compete, there's one more thing I think I should say, and that is we do want to look for areas of engagement, try to cooperate with China when our interests are aligned and when it's in, to the benefit of the United States. John Podesta the president's climate change advisor is also here this week. And, you know, China's 28% of global emissions. The United States is 10%, but we are the two leading carbon emitters. And so we do want to work with the Chinese to encourage them to meet their Paris uh, commitments from the international agreement. We mentioned fentanyl. It's very much in the interest of the United States not to walk away from this relationship, but to be in the trenches pushing for progress to um, stem the flow of those precursor chemicals to the United States. Global public health is a third issue. So this is a largely competitive issue. I spend the great majority of my time on the competitive side, but we do have the engagement uh, side as well. And it's a much more complicated, uh, certainly much less trusting relationship than, we, than, than I think President George H.W. Bush uh, or President Clinton, I served in both of those administrations, had with the Chinese leadership. So I think, mm -hmm. You know, American leaders in both parties, this has been bipartisan, have shifted and have had to shift to face this more aggressive uh, China that is contesting American interests in this part of the world and really around the world. So let me ask you this, in as much as to some extent you're admitting that the H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations 
maybe made too much of a bet on China going a certain way. Um, and that bet turned out to be wrong. But just as much as that might be the case, there are critics who today worry that U.S. policy has gone too far in the other direction. And, you know, I should caveat, I, I am no apologist for China. I know it does things that are harmful for the global order and for democracy. But there is a case to be made um, for how U.S. policy on China today uh, can sometimes be counterproductive. I mean, economists say the trade tariffs hurt Americans more than they help. Uh, and even when you have something like uh, Jake Sullivan's uh, small yard high fence strategy, there's a general critique that national security interests, in other words, what constitutes the yard, is not clearly defined. And so I guess my question is, has the pendulum swung too far in the other direction? Is America being too tough on China? I don't think so. I think we're facing the reality. And, you know, as diplomats, you have to face reality, you have to recognize it, and you have to defend your country's national interest. Here we have in the People's Republic of China, a government that is um, that is far too aggressive against American allies in the South China Sea, that's the Philippines, against Japan and the Senkaku Islands of the East China Sea, that has been far too belligerent and reliant on military intimidation of Taiwan, especially since Speaker Pelosi's visit, a government that is embarked on a major historic modernization of the People's Liberation Army in a way that's very much against the interests of the United States, a China that is um, increasing dramatically its nuclear weapon stockpile and yet refusing to talk to the rest of the world, no transparency about this, a China that is using the organs of its state power, whether it's intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer, I mentioned them both before, um, but also cyber in order to um, advantage, to give advantage to its own companies and yet in a very unfair way, diminish the prospects for fair trade and fair investment. I could go on and on. There are lots of other issues to talk about, but we have to face the reality. China is a major competitor of the United States. Our um, advantage here is that we have a group of like-minded allies that see the same competition and the same threat. If you think about our alliance with Japan, with the Republic of Korea, with Thailand, with the Philippines, with Australia, uh, the development of AUKUS, and of course the emergence of the Quad that includes India, Japan, Japan, uh, Australia, and the United States as a real force, a diplomatic and economic force and strategic force in this region, we have to respond to the challenge that China is posing and to the illiberal policies that it's advocating for the future of the United Nations and the future of the global liberal order that we prize and that we help to create in the wake of the Second World War. This is a very serious challenge to American interests. And we've had no um, recourse but to meet that challenge. At the same time, I do want to accentuate here, Ravi, we also want to use diplomacy as the main instrument in engaging the Chinese. Now, we obviously have sanctioned China in many respects. We've sanctioned most recently the Chinese uh, leadership for its very ill-advised um, support for Russia in the Ukraine war, its political and diplomatic support, um, thousands of Chinese companies providing very important uh, dual-use technology to the Russian defense industrial base that allows Russia to conduct these uh, absolutely abhorrent attacks on civilians in Ukraine. So we're dealing with a major challenge here. I do think we have the right policy. I'm a diplomat, so I also believe that while two governments contest and compete, we have to get keep the people of the country meeting. And this is an issue that hasn't received a lot of attention but because of the, the pandemic, and particularly because of the Chinese government policy of zero COVID, the lockdowns, the closing off of the country, the inability of people to travel here, we're in a situation where we've had one congressional delegation visit China in the last five years. Mm -hmm. uh, until Secretary Blinken and Secretary Yellen visited here in uh, mid-2023, we hadn't had a Secretary of State or Treasury here in four years. We've only had one governor of any American state. That was Governor Gavin Newsom visit here, and he visited last year. And what I really worry about is 
a dramatic reduction of American students here from 15,000 10 years ago to only about 800 now, a dramatic reduction in two-way tourism, flights between the two countries are at best right now uh, one quarter uh, of what they were pre-pandemic. In a situation like this, you don't want to see a decoupling of two societies. It's very important to keep the people of the United States and China working together as the two governments can test a very difficult relationship. So I think that aspect, the, we call it people to people, is very important. I couldn't agree with you more on the people to people, and we will come to that a bit later in this conversation. But um, one of the things that makes it harder to maintain the people to people ties is when there is this sort of hawkish mood in DC, um, which then has a ripple effect uh, across a range of other sectors. But since you brought up alliances, Ambassador, I wanted to bring uh, this other question up of America's role uh, and and sort of the the standing it has uh, to criticize China. I channel a lot of countries in the global South when I say that there are fears that for all that much of the world will agree with everything you've said about China breaking the rules, whether it is you know, the law of the sea, whether it's human rights violation, whether it's currency manipulation, uh, IP laws, they're all valid criticisms. But you know, the response both from Beijing and often from other countries is, and not incorrectly, I should add, is that the United States itself doesn't always follow the rules. Um, it, If you look at how it approaches the courts at the World Trade Organization or how it approaches decisions by, you know, international courts uh, or the UN uh, when it disagrees with their findings, for example, in the Middle East. I know you can't defend all of this, but when your Chinese interlocutors call out what they see as U.S. hypocrisy. How do you respond? I reject it. I don't see any equivalence between uh, the actions of China and the actions of the United States. We have been the major supporter of the liberal order that is the backbone and the superstructure of how the world works today. We've been the defender of that system. And the Chinese, of course, engage the government here, the government-controlled press here, which is not a free press, contests the United States every day, and it distorts our positions. And so we're engaged in a battle of ideas, trying to get accurate information about our society and about our government, about uh, our alliances into the bloodstream here and into the uh, cyber universe here to all the hundreds of millions, if not more than 1 billion people in China on social media. So that's an important part of this. But I do, certainly do not see, or, or nor do I accept any equivalence. The United States has never claimed, any of our presidents, that we're a perfect country and we're transparent. And we often will admit our mistakes when we make them. And both our president and secretary of state have been clear about that. I've said that in fora here. But we stand for democracy. We stand for the right things in the world. And if you take our Indo-Pacific alliances and also the NATO alliance and our close strategic partnership with the US and EU, we have countries that see China in the same way and that are insisting that China live up to, let's say, international standards on human rights. We're not alone in this fight. When it comes to the global South, we've also been very clear because we have strong relationships in Central and South America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, in South Asia. We're not asking countries to choose between a relationship with the United States in a relationship with China. We know for many of these countries, their economic and trade relationship is probably larger for many of them with China, but we are asking them to keep an open mind and an open door about the US. So this is a fair competition, if you will, but it's not a binary one where you're with us or against us. The world doesn't work that way anymore. And I think that message, and particularly Secretary Blinken, has been um, has been showcasing that message in his travels around the world. I think it's a very effective message. And I know here, um, I'm very close and friendly with a lot of the ambassadors from all these countries here. We talk about these issues all the time. So I think the United States, what we offer to the world, stands up uh, on its own. I, I don't apologize for it. And I try to get, uh, I try to give people an accurate portrayal of American society and policy because it's under assault from the state-controlled press here 
that is not telling the truth here in China about the nature of American society or our government. I agree with you with the press. There's no doubt about that. And I, I do wish uh, the Chinese government allowed uh, more of a free press and allowed us to send our reporters there. We don't have anyone there. Um, but, you know, it's not always a black and white thing. I think what I was getting at in my question is that over the last 20 years or so, there has been a decline in U.S. soft power perceptually around the world. Some of that has to do with the way in which uh, the war in Iraq turned out. Some of it has to do with the way in which the war in terror and in Afghanistan turned out. And you could make the case that China and other countries have taken advantage of that to try and you know, portray the United States as a country that says one thing and does another, that talks about a rules-based liberal international order, but often bypasses some of those rules when convenient. That's the criticism I hear from ambassadors and diplomats around the world who sometimes do feel like they are being made to choose uh, between the United States and China and resent that. Ravi, um, it's, you know, when the United States makes mistakes, we normally own up to those mistakes. There's a degree of transparency in our democracy. We're an open book in our democracy uh, that is certainly not present in Russia or China or Iran or Venezuela or the North Korea, just to name a couple of countries that are authoritarian. Uh, and so uh, I think our that transparency helps us. Uh, in terms of our image and American soft power, if you go to sub-Saharan Africa and ask people about what George W. Bush, and who initiated the PEPFAR program, and Barack Obama and uh, did um, billions of dollars spent to save uh, millions of lives, that's a powerful part of American soft power. I'll give you another example that I, as I travel in, in Asia, but also particularly travel throughout China, there's a lot of respect for American science and technology, for the innovative part of our economy, which is a big part of it, for the success we've had in becoming the world leader, for instance, in artificial intelligence. So I don't think America is losing this, but there is a contest for soft power, if you will. And that's a fair contest. My job is to be open. It's to tell the truth about American society and is to combat uh, the lies and misinformation that some of the authoritarian countries spew on a daily basis about the United States. This is a fair battle. And we put a lot of effort into this battle. Uh, we're not so much on the, uh, criticizing other countries as we are defending American values and, and portraying a true picture of American society and of our government's actions. Mm. So um, I promised to take some subscriber questions, and we've gotten so many uh, from around the world. One recurring question is, what do you see as the end state of U.S.-China competition? You know, I think it's clear, as I said before, Ravi, that an essential truth about the U.S.-China relationship, it's going to be competitive for years to come, I think well into the next decade of the 2030s. And so we have to pursue that competition. But in doing so, uh, if you talk about an end state, we want a peaceful relationship between these two very strong countries with the, arguably the two strongest militaries of the world. You see that in what President Biden says when he talks about this relationship, when Secretary Blinken, when Jake Sullivan was here last week, he said, our job is to compete, but to do so in a way that's responsible and to manage these differences through intensive diplomacy. And that's my job here on a daily basis so that while we compete and defend these very important interests to which we're attached, we want to see our allies respected in the South and East China Sea. We want to see human rights respected. We're not going to cease and desist in pursuing those interests, but at the same time, we have to keep the, the peace between these two strongest countries in the world. So that's a major part of what we're doing. End state, you know, history never really ends. It's a continuum. But uh, talking about an end state is to stand up for our values, stand up for our interests, compete responsibly, and yet make sure that there's enough connectivity between us that we drive down the probability of a military conflict. Speaking of that, one of the things we've been pursuing is a closer military-to-military -military channel 
in the wake of the balloon incident, even during the balloon incident, uh, the Chinese refused to talk to our senior military leadership. But now we've made some progress. Uh, I think that uh, Admiral Sam Paparo, who is the uh, Indo-Pacific commander of American forces in this part of the world, is going to have a conversation with a Southern Theater commander of the People's Liberation Army uh, in the next uh, few weeks. We very much hope uh, that, that, that that will continue at even more so, uh, senior levels. Secretary Austin, his counterpart, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Brown and his counterpart. We've got to have that connectivity so that if there is an accident or a misunderstanding, our military leaders can meet to lower the temperature, divide uh, any parties that have collided or are arguing, and make sure that we have a rational way to resolve problems. That's very important on the military side. Another example, AI obviously has enormous promise for human society, but there are, are major risks, particularly um, given the military risks associated with AI. We've had one conversation with the Chinese leadership in Geneva a couple of months ago. We hope to work to be able to have a second conversation and continue a dialogue that has to happen with all the countries in the world, but particularly between the US and China, how do we manage these risks responsibly so that AI does not increase the probability of conflict? Mm -hmm. this is, these are, um, these are uh, ground truth issues that are vital for the national security of both of our countries. And that's why we have to engage diplomatically consistently every day. And that's my main job here and the great team that I have here in China at our embassy in Beijing and at our consulates in Wuhan and Shenyang, Guangzhou and Shanghai. So on the end state question, and this is a live debate uh, here in the United States. So Matt Pottinger, who worked on China policy in the Trump administration, he says that the United States should not manage competition. It should win it. And he defines winning as, and I'll quote him here, this is from an essay in Foreign Affairs. He says, China's communist rulers would give up trying to prevail in a hot or cold conflict with the United States and its friends. Sounds like a very different description of competition than what you just laid out. I have a lot of respect for Matt, Matt Pottinger and for Mike Gallagher, a former Congressman Gallagher, who is his co-author on that Foreign Affairs piece. I read it carefully twice. Um, two, two points I'd make in response. One, there's an insinuation, maybe even more direct than that, in the article that somehow we're running a feckless detente-like policy more reminiscent of the 1970s than the 2020s. We're running, as I've just described in this interview, a very tough-minded policy based on defending American national interest and accentuating and building America's military and diplomatic strength in the Indo-Pacific. And I think a fair assessment of President Biden's policy is that we've been very successful in this region, that our alliances are stronger because of what we've done uh, with the Japanese, with the Republic of Korea, with the Philippines, with Australia uh, over the last three and a half years. I think what often is not mentioned is the success we've had in working with the European Union and NATO to focus them on the problems of both Taiwan, uh, the Chinese activities in the Taiwan Strait, as well as an aggressive China in this region. Uh, the fact that we're all working uh, for the same purpose is a very, very important strengthening of our policy. Second, um, I think we're, we'll do best in US-China policy if our allies support us. And all of those treaty allies of the United States have important trading relationships with the People's Republic of China, as do we. China's our third largest trade partner after Mexico and Canada. So if the suggestion is that somehow we have an outright competition um, and that we decouple the two economies, um, I don't think that policy would be successful. I think it would harm American economic and strategic interest. What we're doing is to strengthen deterrence and that means we enhance the ability to keep the peace out here in a situation like the Taiwan Straits or the Senkaku Islands in building up American military power so that it's very much respected, as I think it is, by the government here. Um, and I think that is that and relying on our allies is a much more successful policy in the future for the United States. And I think 
there are a lot of people in Washington who would agree with that articulation, my articulation of the policy. Mm. So let me ask you a question about um, the Biden administration's China policy, and that's on export controls. Uh, are the restrictions on things like semiconductors, how much are they hurting the Chinese? And you know, in conversations with them, do they bring that up with you? How do they react to that? They, I'm smiling because they bring it up in every meeting with me and with all the visitors that we have here. You know, this is a very important um, decision that President Biden made. We are not going to allow the export of highly sensitive dual use American technology like advanced semiconductors, because we know if we allow the export of those American products, they'll give an advantage to the People's Liberation Army and to others in, in the Chinese government. And we cannot allow that to happen. That is straightforward. We've been clear about it. And from October 2022, when we first announced this, uh, we've actually enhanced those restrictions. The president's executive order on artificial intelligence from uh, just over a year ago is another example of that. What's interesting about the Chinese complaints uh, here in Beijing is that they're doing the same thing, but they're just not talking about it. Mm -hmm. China embarked in 2015 on a strategy to dominate these critical industries. It was called Made in China 2025. And China does not allow its sophisticated technologies to be uh, exported to the United States or to Japan or to Korea or to Western Europe. And so um, this is a fair competition. We obviously have the right policy here. We're de-risking. It's a small percentage of overall US-China trade, but I think there's large scale agreement in our society that it would not make any sense to give China the kind of technologies that could allow them to seek to overtake us in military and technological power. At the same time, Secretary Raimondo and I have both said this, Secretary Yellen has said it, we don't want to decouple um, a major trade relationship because apart from these sensitive technologies, I'll give you the example of healthcare. We're trading in that. American companies are providing essential exports to China. Agriculture is another. Consumer products are two, are two other examples. Uh, there are about 750,000 American jobs that depend on trade with China. We're the two largest economies. As Secretary Yellen has said several times, it would be disastrous if we tried to decouple those economies. So it's de-risking on the national security side, it's not ending US-China trade on the other mm -hmm. hand. I want to talk about climate change and cooperation there. And uh, this one's a subscriber question from Wolfgang Pape. And he points to what he identifies as a policy contradiction. So the United States wants to achieve its emissions targets as set out in the Paris Agreement, at least with the Biden administration. And yet the White House is protecting against imports of electronic vehicles uh, from China. How do you justify that? I don't believe these are mutually exclusive. On the one hand, we're very serious about meeting our commitments under the Paris Agreement. In fact, because of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, um, the billions of of dollars we're spending on green energy technology, that's going to allow us to meet our international commitments very much in the interest of our own country on climate change, on limiting the average global increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. On the other hand, very important for us to protect our own markets against unfair competition. And, you know, we believe and many other countries believe that China is engaged in what economists call overcapacity. The level of subsidies, both from the government in Beijing, but particularly the provincial governments, means that uh, China, Chinese manufacturers of electric vehicles, of solar panels, of lithium batteries, just to name three of these products, the, 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 the output, the total output this year and last year exceeds demand here several times over. These products are then being essentially dumped in Turkey, in Western Europe, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Canada, and the United States. And we're simply not going to permit a loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States because of this unfair competition from China. We went through the China ch shock at the in the 1990s, in the beginning of this century, and lost millions of American jobs. And President Biden has been clear in levying these tariffs on China, 100% on Chinese EVs, that we're not going to do that again. And it's been interesting, Ravi, to see we're not alone in this. Mm 
Canada has taken this action. Brazil, Turkey, the European Union have all taken action. And China, I think, has been put on notice. It can't resolve its own economic problems here by exporting unfairly and at artificially low prices these um, EVs and solar panels to the rest of the world. We have to protect our own markets. Final point on this, and but President just, Biden- just, uh, uh, just, uh, just on that, Ambassador, if I may, th there's a school of thought that goes that the climate crisis is so urgent and, and so important to deal with that you take anything you can get. You take the drastic measures even if that means that one country is unfairly, as you put it, flooding the market with cheaper EVs, that those very EVs could then lead to infrastructure in countries like the United States, which does not have the best infrastructure for um, you know, recharging EVs and what have you, and the related markets that go along with that. This would help the fight against climate change. And the answer to that, and thank you for that point, Robbie, the answer to that, uh, and it was my my final point on this issue, is that we don't want a world where um, all of us around the world are entirely dependent on China for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years for the green technologies that will polish, that will propel a consistent departure from carbon towards a new economic future. We all have to have the ability, whether it's Japan or Korea or Mexico or the United States, to be producing these products ourselves. So through the Inflation Reduction Act, we're giving our industries a chance and shielding them from unfair Chinese competition so that we can be part of this. And I think one of the fundamental lessons of the pandemic is you don't want to be reliant on a single source of a critical mineral or critical technology, certainly not a, from a country or People's Republic of China that's willing to withhold those technologies for other motives, and they've proven that they can do that. So we stand by this strategy. So you've been in China for three years now. Um, what keeps you up at night? Is it Taiwan? Is it the South China Sea? Is it China's nuclear buildup? What worries, I, I worry about a lot of things. I'm paid to worry as a diplomat. I certainly worry about an unintended conflict in uh, between our military forces, uh, uh, an accident an accidental collision. Um, our navies and air forces are operating in international waters, international airspace in very close proximity in this entire region. And that's why we want to have a commitment from the government of China that should an accident occur, we can have instantaneous communication between our military leaders to reduce the temperature, separate the parties and resolve the problem. I worry about that. I certainly worry um, and have, have great concerns about um, the aggressive nature of the PLA's military buildup and of the aggressive, intimidating behavior of the PLA Navy when it comes to our ally, the Philippines, uh, or our ally, Japan. Those are important. But on another level, we also have to worry about the future. America needs to be obviously competitive when we think about uh, this, this major technological shift in quantum mathematics, biotechnology, artificial intelligence. So one of the key aspects of our China policy is to strengthen the American economy and our industrial base at home. We were successful in the Cold War, and I'm old enough that the, la the first 10 years of my career in diplomacy in the State Department were the last 10 years of the old Cold War we were successful in large part because of our economic and industrial strength. And I think President Biden's very sharp focus, laser-like focus on rebuilding our economy for a 20th, 21st century economic model is a key to the China policy. Retaining our military strength and funding our military, particularly our Air Force and Navy here in the Indo-Pacific is the key to stability and preserving the peace that's what deterrence is all about. So these are just some of the things that I worry about, but I'm paid to worry out here on point for the U.S. and China. Last question. You're quite famous for having having taken a high-speed rail all over China. What have you seen that has surprised you the most? We know it's interesting. You know, when you're ambassador to another country, obviously a big part of the job is you are the point of contact between the two governments. Um, but you're also ambassador to the entire country. And so I have made it 
especially since the pandemic ended and we could travel again in China and we're not locked down, try to get out and meet the Chinese people. And it's so much easier to do that by rail because, you know, you can walk up and down the aisle, you sit next to somebody uh, who's Chinese and you start talking. And, you know, you see, when I go to Shanghai, for instance, from Beijing, it's four and a half hours on high-speed rail. You cross the Yellow River and you cross the Yangtze River. These are the two iconic rivers of Chinese civilization and culture. And it gives you a much deeper appreciation of the people of China itself. And so what we're trying to do, I'm trying to do as ambassador is meet the Chinese people, meet provincial party secretaries and governors, meet business people. I shoot baskets with kids on basketball courts. I like, I'm an old person, but I like to shoot baskets. You just try to relate to people and, and, and building an accurate picture of America and projecting uh, an America that wants to live in peace with China through all the difficulties that you and I have talked about. I think that's an important message that we want our students to come back, that we want the Chinese people, uh, young people to be studying in our country and they're, well over 290,000 Chinese students in the United States. I think, again, as these two governments, our two governments compete, we've got to work to keep people connected. Traveling by train is one minor way to do that, but I enjoy it and I think it's effective. Welcome to 在这个信息泛滥、真相难觅的时代无论是政治不要只是阅读新闻，要解码新闻，理解新闻，活出新闻。这一切尽在六度解析，立即订阅，不错过任何真知灼见。因为了解真相，仅仅是个开始。